Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna have some fun in my swatch book. I thought it would be time for me to swatch all of the watercolors that I have. Some of them I swatched on a separate sheet when I did not have this swatch book. And when I paint, I have to go get that sheet and this swatch book and compare the two. So I decided that today we would make sure that every watercolor that I own would be in this swatch book. I also decided to not separate the colors by brand. So they're just gonna be in order of the colors. That way I feel like I'm going to be able to make better choices when it comes to choosing colors because if I have two similar colors but in two different brands, I'll be able to see the differences right away because they're gonna be next to each other in this page. I have created three pages on which I'm going to swatch all of my colors. You might tell me that when I get more colors, they won't be in this spread, which is true, but that's okay. <laughs> so we're going to proceed in order. Each row contains six spots. So I already placed my colors in order. So these first colors here that you can see, they're going to go on the first row. Then this, these colors here, they're going to go on the second row. These here are going to go on the third row. And then we're going to switch pages. So they're already split in rows. And I put all of the Schmincke Hordem at the end because they're so different. They Sometimes the pigments separate and since they're that different, I'm just going to keep them at the end. So they're still going to be in the same spreads, but these ones are going to be separated by brand. When I'm done swatching everything, I'm going to write the names of each color with their properties. So when comes the time to pick a color, then I have a better idea of which ones are light fast, which ones are opaque, etc. All right, so let's start swatching. I have recreated a template that I made up for this swatch book. If you want to see a bit more about all of the templates I created for this swatch book, you can go see my swatch book video. It's going to be linked right here. I made a couple of uh, modifications. So I did the squares using a colored pencil instead of a like dark ink pen. I thought maybe it would blend in a little bit more. This color is a lot paler. So I don't know. I thought maybe it would be a better choice. We'll see. Also, I didn't trace the rectangles with a ruler or anything. So it's a bit more like a drawn on look. I like it. So first of all, we're going to start with titanium white. I know that maybe there's not much point in swatching it, um, but I uh, will still do it. It's from Windsor & Newton. And I have to say that I bought this color when I did not know much about watercolors. Obviously, like I don't really see the point in having a white. I don't think I have ever used it. Maybe if I paint on a dark paper, but it's not very useful, I think. We won't even see it. I'm gonna do the dispersion test anyways, but I don't think it's like useful at all. Now let's move on to buff titanium or titanium buff from Van Gogh. This is a color that I've used a lot. I really love it. This tube is almost empty, so I ordered a new one. I love how subtle the color is. I've used it a lot for mixing my colors, but these days I've been using it a lot too in my abstract watercolors to act as a pale color. So I have a good contrast with my other colors. Now we're going to swatch Daniel Smith buff titanium, which is going to be super interesting to see the both of them side by side. The colors are really different. You'll see. At first I bought this tube to replace my Van Gogh one that was almost empty. I decided to give myself an upgrade but when i swatched it i realized it was so different i really like this color too but it's not the same 
So I I got another one of the Van Gogh one because yeah, they could have different names because they're not the same colors at all. And actually in my abstract paintings, I've liked using the two of them. Sometimes I mix them together, sometimes not. Um, so it's given me a bigger range. So I like it. I'm happy. I'm happy I got the two of them. At first, I kind of regretted getting this one because it was kind of a shock. I was expecting a color that was way less yellow. Uh, but I just use it differently. Now we are going to go into Naples Yellow Red from Van Gogh. I've used this color quite a lot too. I need to mix it because the, I forgot how it's called. I think it's gum Arabic. They use it to mix with the pigment. It's after a while it can separate. I really like this color. I use it a lot for, well, I, I did, I used to use it a lot when I created some portraits. Kind, it's kind of a good color for mixing skin tones, I feel like. And yeah, it's a lot more interesting on paper than the color that it looks like on the tomb, I feel like. You might hear my cat in the background. He just woke up and um, he's always hungry. Always. Okay, so now we are going to try Van Gogh Permanent Lemon Yellow. This color is very thick. I feel like maybe I should try to mix it. It's a weird texture. It's a very vibrant color. It looks like it's quite opaque. I'm gonna write down the, um, the colors, properties when everything is dried. So I'm gonna have a look at what it says on the website about the light fastness, the opacity, the granulation, everything. Because this is important information that I need to consider when I'm making a choice of which color to use in a painting. And now we'll swatch maybe a somewhat of a similar color. This is the Grumbacher Camium Yellow Pale. And I'm sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce this company name. This is the only color that I have uh, from them. No, it's not that similar. Very pretty, very vibrant as well. Yeah, I really like this color. I think I should use it more. Maybe I'm gonna put it in a palette. Oh, the next color will be similar, I think. It's the Windsor Newton Cutman Cadmium Yellow Hue. So we'll see which one of the two I like the best. I think it's gonna be similar, but it's a... This one was the pale one, so it should be a bit of a darker hue. I'm sure it's gonna be very interesting. And this is what I like about doing these swatches mixing all the brands that I have is that I really can compare all my colors a lot better because I see them side by side. Ah, oh, see, it's different. I really like this range of yellow. Wow. I need to use yellows more. What can I paint that has a lot of yellow? Maybe like a sunset or sunrise? A flower, not flowers. I'm not, I'm not that much into planting flowers. I did some flower spreads over the holidays, but that was kind of a, just a, a thing of the moment. But I don't think flowers are my kind of subjects too much, but maybe it's just that I need to find a style that suits me better. Yeah, I think that's it. I think I could paint pretty much anything if I find a style that I find interesting. Now 
maybe this is going to be a similar color. We're going to swatch the Windsor and Newton yellow ochre, which is a color that I really like. Yeah, it's different. I really love yellow ochre. Such a pretty color. This one looks like it's pretty transparent. I don't know if all yellow ochres are transparent or not. And now another ochre that's going to be very interesting to swatch, it's Daniel Smith Burgundy Yellow Ochre. So I'm excited to see the difference between the two. And that's going to be the last of our yellows, I think. Well, if we can consider it a yellow, yes, I think we can. It's kind of a, an earth, earth tone yellow. I find that the Daniel Smith have like a tickier consistency when you use them, when you try to create a matte tone. So it's, you kind of have to put some water in there to get it to be a bit more creamy. So we can see the difference between the two already. I feel like this one is a bit more green than this one. And also I feel like this color is more vibrant. It's more pigmented, which maybe it is, maybe it's not, maybe it's just me. All right, let's see the dispersion. Oh, and also, I can already see that this ochre is very pig uh, not pigmented, I mean it's very um, granulating. Which makes sense because I like my colors to be granulating, so it's something that I, I look for when I go to buy new colors. I, I make sure to check their granulation levels, which is something that I did not do when I was buying Van Gogh colors because I was new with watercolors. So I just bought all the colors that look appealing or useful without really thinking about light fastness or any other properties. I wonder why I bought an orange, to be honest. Now I don't think it's that useful because I have lots of yellows, I have some reds, I could mix an orange easily if I wanted to, and also I don't really like orange as a color like there's colors that i love and you'll see that i have a lot of of paints of, for that for these colors like greens i have lots of colors for for these colors i have lots of um earth tones as well because i love these so sometimes i'm gonna grab the same color but in different brand just because i love that color so much and i want to see the differences between the brands well at least I only have one orange. So it's not like I bought like 10 and now I was wondering why I did that. I only have one. Now, let's swatch Van Gogh Vermilion. This is a color that I know I love so much. I love these bright, like fiery reds, like orangey reds. Like if we consider this one as an orange, this is the orange that I like. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, I realized one thing that I forgot to do. Usually I put like a dark line on the side to see if the colors are opaque or not. So if they cover that line completely, then they're opaque. Or, well, we can see at what level of opacity these paints are. And I forgot for this, but I'm just gonna look in the, like in the website and find out what it says for opacity and write it down. I love this color so much. I think I haven't used it a lot because it's a bit less permanent. It's a bit less light fast than other reds that I have. So I've been going towards these other reds, but I love this one so much. Now we're going to try Daniel Smith Cadmium Red Medium Hue. It looks a bit like it could be similar. I have to mix it. Yeah. On the palette, it looks similar, maybe a bit cooler. Yeah, we can see it already. It's cooler than Vermilion. But it's still like very bright. But I can definitely see more blue in this color. 
I can already see the granulation in this one. It's great. Ooh, we're done with our first two rows. Now we have a bit more red, but we're going to go towards the blues now. Our last red is Cadmium Red Hue from Windsor & Newton Cotman. This one is a bit more warm than the one we just swatched. I only have three reds, but they're so beautiful and they're different, each of them. So I'm really happy to have them side by side. I know I said that already, but I was just thinking it right now. It's going to be so useful. can see that the colors are pooling a little bit is because I'm using a mixed media sketchbook so it's not exactly made for watercolors it's absorbent but it's not watercolor paper so it has its limits so it's pooling but it's okay because I use this sketchbook because I'm not only swatching watercolors in it I'm also swatching a lot of different other paints and pencils and stuff like that so that's why it's pooling. You can see like on this side right here, but it's okay. It kind of gives me another opportunity because sometimes when I paint, I use a lot of water. And even if I use watercolor paper, we can see the paper buckling and it creates these, these pools, these areas where the watercolor pools. So I can't see what happens when it happens. <laughs> I can see that this, for example, this one, it tends to bloom. We'll see. So we can still learn from it, even if it's not ideal. Now we're going to swatch Van Gogh Quinacridone Rose. I have two pinks and this is another color that I'm kind of wondering why I bought them because I don't really like pink. I don't really use pink, but I've been watching a lot of color mixing videos. So I think that I could use these colors to mix let's say like with a green to create a super interesting brown or different shades of, of brown. Maybe if I use a green in this color, it could neutralize it a little bit and maybe then I would love to use it. So I think I really need to explore. It's gonna be on my uh, video list to create because there's something to do with these colors. Even if like at first glance, I'm not very attracted to them. It's just a great opportunity for me to practice color mixing, which I think is very important. Now we have Van Gogh Rose. We'll see the difference between the two pinks. Oh, I can already see it on the palette. I think it's gonna be, it looks like it's a bit more pastel. So maybe there's some white in this mix. We'll know more about it when I look at the, the pigment information. Yeah, and it looks more opaque. So I'm thinking there's some white added in this mix. All right, now we're gonna move on to some purples. Well, only, no, two, two purples. So Quinacridone Purple Blue from Van Gogh. I have to say it's a color that I haven't used a lot. The tube is pretty much full still, but maybe I can, I think that's what I'll do. I'll do a video in which I work on color mixing using the colors that I don't use a lot. So I can work on some like recipes to come up with colors that I am in love with and that I will use. So these colors won't be bought in vain. Because I feel like I look at this color and it has a lot of dimension. The darker parts are very dark, almost black. And then the lightest part, we can see a lot of red in them and blue. So I think we can really create something interesting with this mix. Yeah, definitely. I feel like we can see some color separation, which is not something I was expecting. Now we're going to swatch Van Gogh Dusk Violet. It's a color that I love so much. I want to buy all of their dusk colors. I only have two. I think they only have one more, which I forget the name. And if you know any dusk colors 
in other brands please tell me because they're amazing and you'll see why i hope you can see it well so when you use them like at mass tone they're very dark this color is so creamy too all right so very dark almost black right and now let's add some water maybe let's add more water these colors are super granulating and they create the most interesting effects when you mix them with water so we're just gonna let it dry and you'll see once it's dry i love it so much and now we are going into the blues so we're gonna swatch our first blue phthalo blue this is an interesting blue but i have to say i don't use it that much i wonder why it's interesting because it's like a greenish blue i think there's different type of phthalos also depending on the brand i think it's winsor and newton they have like a phthalo green and a phthalo red so when you swatch them side by side you can see a red or green undertone I would say that this one is green, but I don't think that Van Gogh has these two different types of Taylor blues. I don't think. I haven't seen them, but I haven't really looked for them either, So, but I don't think so. Okay, so let's wait for this page to dry. Well, we can start the second page, and when everything is dry, I'm going to give you some close-ups. All right, now we're going to start... Well, we're going to continue with the blues and then we'll move on with the greens. So exciting. So now we're going to swatch the Cobalt Blue Ultramarine by Van Gogh. Oh, I feel like I need to add a bit of water because it's uh, it's kind of sticky, a bit like the Daniel Smith watercolors that I have. I don't know why like the consistency changes like that. I don't know. like. For sure, like the recipe is different, but I'm wondering what what is responsible for a paint's consistency. If you know, tell me. Also, when you're done watching my video, if you think that there are colors or brands that would be interesting for me, let me know, because I'm always looking into like trying new colors. What I like in a color is when I can create some texture with it. So when it's granulating, I love that. Or if there's a good mixing potential, but that I think I'm going to have to discover maybe on my own. Or if you think that for some of the colors where I tell you that I'm not a fan of, if you know what I should do with them, or if there's a good mix I could try, yeah, let me know. I think it's going to be an interesting series though, trying to create some interesting mixes with colors that I don't really like as they are. Yeah, we'll do that. Now we're going to swatch three Daniel Smith watercolors, which is very exciting. We're going to start with Identron Blue. It's very dark as a mass tone, but you'll see that it gets super interesting when you add a bit more water, like the color is beautiful. It makes me think of like a darker tail blue because we can see some green in it, but not as much as phthalo so. But it still makes me think of it. It is granulating. I can already start to see it. Now let's see its dispersion. Now we're going to swatch Daniel Smith Blue Appetite Genuine. I really love this color. It has a lot more green in it than the one we previously swatched. You'll see. Well, we can already see it when we compare them side by side. The mass tone is not as dark, I feel like, as the other one.
Yeah, I love this color so much. It's very granulating too. Now we are going to swatch Daniel Smith Mayan Blue Genuine, another color that is very pretty. So we can see that these um, these four blues right here, they're very different from one another. So that's great. Even with the phthalo that we swatched previously, like this phthalo is also very different from these four. So I feel like I have a really good range. And we still have two blues to swatch. They're gonna be different as well. This one will be well, this one is Cerulean Blue Phthalo from Van Gogh. I feel like there is some white mixed into this because it's more a bit more on the pastel side and it's more opaque, but I could be wrong. It's just a feeling. Just when I compare it to other colors that are more transparent, it is very different from the other colors that I have. And let's swatch this one, Van Gogh Turquoise Blue. We're getting into the green territory now. But I'm kind of surprised uh, by how many blues I have. I have a lot. Well, today is another day. I decided to stop that day because um, I was starting to lose the light. So I wanted to make sure that you had beautiful lighting for this video, for the most part. So um, we're gonna continue now. It's a couple of days later, so I'm actually super excited to start again. So this next row here is going to be some turquoise and greens. We're going to start with Van Gogh Turquoise Green. It's a very pretty color. It seems like it's transparent. Yeah, I don't know what to do with my cat. I think I'm going to have to go play with him because he won't let us film. This color seems to be granulating, which is not something that I expected. I don't use it too much, so I kind of don't know it very much. It's very pretty. Okay, now we're going to swatch. Van Gogh permanent green. You can see maybe that this tube is quite full after a couple of years of owning it. So I think that this one would be a good contender for some mixing, uh, some mixing studies. If I can open it, the mass tone seems to be pretty opaque. Yeah, I think it would be a super good color, a super beautiful color if I just like neutralize it a little bit. Maybe using the bright pink that I said I don't like that much or that I don't really have a use for. So I think it could be really cool to use these two colors and create a third that I'm going to love a lot more. Okay. The third color in this row is Van Gogh Olive Green. Well, I can't open it. I'm going to try more later. But in the meantime, this is a color that I put in this palette. Oh no, in another palette. Let me go get it. So it's in here. So I'm going to use this one to create my swatch. It's just maybe I, I won't get a mass tone that will be as strong as I would like. The color is going to be diluted. But once I'm able to open the tube, maybe I'll go back on the mass tone part and try to deepen it a little bit. Yeah, 
super pretty color now we are going to try van gogh sap green which if i remember correctly is a color that i really liked yeah it's so pretty i like these uh, warmer greens i think maybe that's why i'm not so much of a fan of this one the permanent green because it tends to be colder and that's why i think it's, it would be interesting if i try to modify it maybe it's gonna be a bit warmer if i add a warm pink anyways we're gonna try a bunch of stuff hmm. seems like it's, it stays in place pretty much i put a lot of water on there so i would have thought maybe it would move a bit more now it's going to be interesting. We're going to try Daniel Smith's sap green. I feel like the, um, the mass tone is a lot richer. The paint feels rich, richer, more pigmented than the Van Gogh one, which would make sense because it's higher quality. I think both of these paints are granulating but I think the Daniel Smith is more granulating because I can already see it start to granulate. Oh yeah this one moves a lot. And then last one for this row we're gonna try Windsor & Newton Cotman Hooker's Green Dark. This one I don't like as much which I think makes sense when I say that I don't like cooler greens although I feel like it's a bit more like ashy than the other greens which is something that I like I like colors that tend to be a bit more neutral a bit less vibrant I don't like it as much but I still like it more than this one for sure I think it's a color I can use easily and it's pretty soothing too. Maybe I could use it in uh, an abstract watercolor. I like to use soothing colors for these paintings. Okay, so we're done with this roll. We're going to move on to our final roll for this page. And then we'll only have one page left. Um, okay, so I just realized that I made a mistake. There's one more rectangle, one more swatch area than I wanted for this page. The thing is I wanted to put seven swatch areas on the last page because the last row that I wanted to paint was for my Schmincke super granulating colors. So I think that on our last page we'll miss one. So I'm gonna have to put it here which sucks because things won't be in as much of an order as I wanted but that's okay it's still gonna be interesting and I think if I look at my lineup for the Schmincke Hardam super granulating colors I think that the last color will be very pretty with this row because this row is a row of green and we're starting to get into the earth colors and this last color here from Schmincke is a mix of a green and rust kind of. You'll see it's super interesting. So I think actually it's going to be very pretty here. It's just that I wanted all of my Schmincke to be on the same page, on the last page. But that's okay, I guess. <laughs> we will live with it. All right, so now let's watch Daniel Smith Rare Green Earth. Oh yes, this color needs a bit of water because... Daniel Smith colors sometimes they feel like they need a bit more water because they're maybe I should mix them I don't know I feel like they're not as smooth sometimes they're thicker and yeah so this one is a transparent color I think because even the mass tone is not super dark But it's a granulating color. I really like it. 
I like that it's almost like a gray kind of. Well, it's like a, a green that tends a bit towards gray. For me, at least that's how I see it. Oh, and okay, you might hear my cat. Um, he's grooming himself. So at least he, he's not screaming anymore. He calmed down a little bit, but if you hear some weird noises, it's my cat. Take it as extra ASMR. Next color is Daniel Smith Zoocyte Genuine. I think it's going to be interesting to see the two of them side by side because they look quite similar, at least if we look at the tubes. Yes, yeah, same thing with this one. It needs a bit more water, but at least it it feels somewhat more opaque. We're able to achieve a darker mass tone than with rare green earth. Oh, and it looks very granulating, which is fun. It also tends toward a bit of a gray, but it feels warmer than um, rare green earth, which is great. Yeah, it's super granulating. It's very fun. So yeah, they're very similar. I think that maybe you don't need the two colors, but you can get the one you prefer, whether you like cooler colors or warmer ones. And also we can really see that the Zoicide Genuine is very granulating. So that is a plus for me. Next, oh, this is a color that I love so much. We swatched already uh, Dusk Violet, and now we're gonna swatch Dusk Yellow from Van Gogh, which I love even more than Dusk Violet. For real, I need all the dust colors. This one is amazing. I hope that in this tiny swatch, you'll be able to see how good it is. But the pigments, they separate so much. You can really see the yellow in there. I think it's a mix with like a black pigment and a yellow pigment and it separates. So when you swatch it at mass tone, it's super dark. But then when you add the water, that's where it gets so good. So we're gonna let it dry, let it work, and I uh, will see. And let's see the dispersion. I don't know if you can see, but I can already see the yellow pigments coming out and I already see some granulation. It's amazing, yeah. All right, now we're gonna get into our earth tones. We're gonna start with Daniel Smith Potter's Pink which is a new color for me. I got it not too long ago after hearing about it so much. The one thing that I was surprised about with this paint is that it's quite transparent. I thought it would be more opaque than that, but it's okay. I love the color. See how it's so transparent. I'm gonna try to darken it a little bit. Yeah, to be honest, I think it's as dark as it's going to get. But it's super granulating. It's super pretty. I don't think it's like, it won't be your main color for your painting, but it's a very good supporting color. Two other Daniel Smith that I love so much. This one is amazing. It's Quinacridone Sienna. And I think that Quinacridone colors are known for their vibrancy. And it's true, this one is so vibrant. It's one of my favorite colors. See how fiery that is. And it's granulating. It's amazing. I love it so much. This one would have been good also if I put it with the oranges and the reds, but I see it as 
an earth tone, but maybe it's not. It looks a little bit like my vermilion color, but in a more orangey version. Next, we will swatch Daniel Smith Burn Yellow Ochre, which when I bought it, I thought it would be more yellow, like yellow ochre, but I kind of realized it doesn't make any sense if I look at the color on the two. This is not yellow, not close from it, but I don't know. I thought maybe it would be. And if I remember correctly on the swatch at the store, I remember it being more yellow. So when I swatched it, I kind of had a shock, but then the shock passed and I'm super happy with this color. It looks a little bit like the quinacridone sienna. Like they, they look like they're in the same family, but this one is a bit redder. We can get a pretty dark mass tone with it. And our dispersion test. Okay, so now we're gonna wait for this page to dry. I could swatch the Schminke now, but I kind of want to keep them for last. So we're gonna wait for this page to dry. We're gonna swatch our last page. And then we're gonna come back to it to put our last color for this uh, exercise, which I think is one of the best ones. Okay, so we're gonna start our third page, third and final page. We will start by swatching Light Oxide Red from Van Gogh, which if I remember correctly, was a very pretty color. Yeah, it's so pretty. I remember using it a lot when I did the landscapes. Well, the landscapes. I say the landscapes like <laughs> like it's a thing. When I used to paint landscapes, which I feel like I should start again. I know that I've been painting a lot of abstract paintings, but I still like painting other subjects. So maybe I'm just going to do a bit of a bit of landscapes and other things for a little bit but still while doing some landscapes because they need to dry so while they dry I can do something else such a pretty color Okay, so let's do the dispersion test as well. Maybe first I need to make sure that the water that I put on is clean. So let's start over. It's pretty clean. Okay. And we can already see that it's starting to bloom and doing some nice effects. So, so far I really like doing this because I feel like it reminds me of some colors that I haven't used that much, but that I liked in the past a lot. So I think it's going to be a really good exercise. Now we're going to swatch Burn Sienna from Van Gogh. Oh yeah, this is a pretty color too. I feel like it looks similar to the previous one that I just swatched, but it's warmer. Well, is it? No, maybe not. They're both warm, but this one has a bit more orange in it and the other one is a bit more red. 
So they're very similar other than that. But it's really good to have them swatched side by side because when I need a color like that, I can really see the difference and pick the one that I need. But I think the most difference, we're going to see it once it's a bit more diluted. We can already see a lot more yellow. Compared to the light oxide red, I think we're going to see a lot more yellow. Yeah. Now let's do the dilution test. The dispersion test, not dilution test. All right. Yeah, we can see that there's a big difference between the two when we look at them next to each other. They're kind of in the same family though, but they're not the same at all. Now we're going to swatch the Van Gogh Copper, which is a color that I kind of discovered recently. To be honest, I have no... Oh yeah, I remember I bought it because... I thought it would be a really pretty color. I had no idea that it was a metallic, which now I think doesn't make sense. I would have to assume that it's a metallic just based on the name. But when I bought it, I was quite new with watercolor. So I had no idea like what a metallic color was. So I bought it because I thought it would be like a rust color or something like that. And then when I tried it, I realized it was metallic. And I have to say that metallic colors are not really my thing, still to this day. But in the recent past, maybe in the past couple of weeks or months, I found a way to use it, which is like to incorporate it with other colors. So by itself, I don't think I could use it. Like it couldn't be like the main color of a piece because I'm not that much into metallics. I guess it could change, but for now it hasn't. And um, yeah, so I, I found a way to use it because I was doing I was doing a an abstract landscape and I thought it needed like a pop of something. The colors that I was using were quite dark, quite moody. So I had this idea of like maybe using this copper in my piece and it really added something interesting. So I think that's a way I could use this color. Now the dispersion test. Okay, now we are going to swatch our first Daniel Smith color of this page, which is Tiger's Eye Genuine. And one thing that really surprised me with this color is how transparent it is. I did not expect that when I bought it. But to be fair, I bought it while I was in the store. So I did not make any research. I did not see it, I think, anywhere else before. Usually when I buy these more expensive colors, I've been influenced by another artist or something. So I, I know that I like these colors and like I put them on my list. But this one, I kind of just saw the swatch in the store and I really liked it. So I bought it. But when I tried it, I realized that it's very transparent. So I was surprised at first, but now I have to say that it's fine. It's fine by me. And I have used it quite a lot. So this page, you might have guessed, is kind of for the earth colors, the rust colors. So you will see a lot of those. And we'll get, we'll get into the darker colors at the end. And we're going to finish our last row with the Schmincke colors. Do you see it's very transparent? When you try to use it at its mass tone, it leaves a lot of streaks. 
So I think it's it's better for glazing or yeah, something like that perhaps. Let's do the dilution test. The dispersion test. I don't know why I keep saying dilution. If I say that, just like translate in your head that I mean dispersion. <laughs> Okay, now back to Van Gogh, we're gonna try Van Dyke Brown. Some of these colors I've had for a while, so I kind of need to mix them because I see that the... the how do I say that? I forgot. The thing that they, they mix with the pigment, it kind of separates. So you have to use a Q-tip, uh, not a Q-tip like this, but you have to use like a thing to mix it again. If you notice a change in the um, camera angle or something like that, it's because my battery died. So I try to replicate the same angle, but sometimes there, there can be a little bit of a difference. So the mask tone is very dark. Let's see what it looks like when we add a little bit more water. I kind of forgot because I don't use this color very often but I've been more into using my Daniel Smith colors recently and since I've been working on some abstract paintings I, I kind of focus on one color so I don't use a big range of colors anymore so that's why I kind of forgot but I'm super happy to have been doing this exercise because it reminds me of some colors that I used to love and use so much I think I already said that not too long ago It's fun to play around with colors like this. <laughs> okay, and now the di no dispersion test. The dispersion test. <laughs> Ooh, see how this one started to move right away? Oh, maybe it's gonna stop. Who knows? We'll see. Okay, now another Van Gogh sepia. Oh, I remember that I really like this color. I have a lot of Van Gogh colors because that's what I bought when I started using watercolors. And they're a really good brand. They're student grade, but most of them are light fast. So I feel like they're a good choice. You could still sell paintings. I think the difference between these and their professional versions is maybe that you're gonna prefer when you swatch the both of them like let's say you wash a professional sepia compared to this one side to side you might prefer the color of the professional sepia but other than that i feel like they're like a pretty good choice when you want to find something affordable i don't hear about these too much on youtube though so i don't know how like common, they are in um, art stores all over the world, I don't know. But yeah, I feel like they're a good choice. I really like this color. All right, let's do our dispersion test. Now we're going to go on our second row. We will have two Daniel Smith watercolors, which we will start with. First one is Bloodstone Genuine. When I tried it, I thought it would be more like a violet maybe, or like a reddish color, but it's very dark. So I think maybe there's a, a hint of red or violet in there. Um, but since it's so dark, well, we'll see what it looks like when we dilute it more. 
I had to mix this one too. I think it's been on a shelf for a bit, so that's why sometimes you, like the the color and the the pigment and the like. I think it's gum arabic that they use. It separates and um, you really want to mix your color before you put some on your palette. See the mask tone? It's so dark. It looks like a black. But I feel like I can see a hint of maybe violet. But I would have thought with the name Bloodstone that it would be like a, a rich red color. But I guess maybe not. Well, I can see it's like a... Doesn't have a warm tone or, blue, uh, or a cool tone. This one I have trouble deciding i don't know sometimes i look at it and i feel like it's like a warm color like it, it has a warm undertone and then i look at it two seconds later and i feel like it has a cool undertone i don't know but it creates these beautiful blooms and it granulates so much which is something that i love about daniel smith watercolors well they don't all granulate but i made sure to buy some colors that are granulating because that's that's an effect that I love. Sometimes I hear artists talk about colors and they say, oh, if you like that effect, um, you'll be happy with this one, but it's not everybody who likes granulating colors. And I'm like, what? <laughs> How can someone not love this effect? I have no clue. Now we're gonna swatch Lunar Violet from Daniel Smith once again. This one as well, I thought it would be a bit more violet, but it's kind of like Bloodstone Genuine. It's very dark, but maybe when we dilute it, let's see. The mask tone is very similar to Bloodstone Genuine. I can see maybe a bit more violet in there. Yeah, this one is definitely more violet than this one. This one, I kind of struggle to see the red that the name suggests, but maybe there's no red in it at all. We don't know because it's a genuine color, so we don't have the pigment information. So it's a mystery. Now, back to Van Gogh, we're gonna try Ivory Black. I don't really use black in my watercolor. Well, I've used black recently, in fact, to create the abstract landscapes that you might have seen in one of my somewhat recent videos. But other than that, I had not used black in like forever. Not because well, I think when I started using watercolors, I used black, but then I realized that a lot of artists don't. So I decided to like try not to use it and it worked very well for me. And now when I use it, sometimes I feel weird because like in real life, not there's not a lot of things or shadows that are truly black. Sometimes, well, most of the times you can see another color in there so that's why nowadays when i use like a true black it feels strange now we will go with van gogh paints gray and when you look at the tube this is really a gray color but i feel like this color is a lot more blue than what it looks like in the tube it's a very pretty color 
Yeah, there's a lot of blue in it. I just put some on my palette and I would have thought maybe it's a blue, which is not shown that much on the tube. I replaced the blacks with paints gray a lot when I did some landscapes. That's something that I, I did. Now it's been a while since I've used paints gray, but I think that in my abstract landscapes, it could be very pretty because I use a lot of blue. So I think it could be nice to have like a, a darker blue, almost black, but it's a, still a blue. Like so pretty. Let's see how it spreads. Oh, now we will try Van Gogh Graphite, which is a color that I really dislike. <laughs> I regret buying this color so much. Good thing that this brand is not very expensive. It's also kind of metallic, but gosh, I hate this color. It's like, it's so boring. But if you're into metallics, then I'm sure you can like it very much. It's just me. I'm not into metallics. And like, it's, it's just a gray. I can create a gray with my black or I can create a more interesting gray using paint gray. Ah, but this one is just, it really, it's, it's name is, is perfect for it. It really is a graphite color, which I think is not very interesting, but it's just my personal preference. I just don't like this color. Oh yes, and now we have Interference White. I'm gonna put a stripe of black using acrylics and once it's dried, then I'm gonna put the uh, Interference White on top of both the black and the white part. Just see what the difference is. So let's do that now. So while this dries, we're gonna go to our final row, which will be super fun. I feel like we kept the best for last. We will try the Schminke Horridum Super Granulating Paints. They're so pretty. So we will try these right now. The first one is Schminke Horridum Tundra Rose. They are so pretty. I love them so, so much. And it's when you mix them with water that they become like their most amazing selves. <laughs> we can already see some color separations. I don't know if you can see it on camera, but I already see some yellow, uh, not some yellow, <laughs> some blues and some reds. Yeah, these colors, they're just amazing. And as the name suggests, they granulate so much, which is a lot of fun to use. Now we're gonna try Tundra Violet, which I have, I think I have used this color a lot for my abstract watercolors. So the mask tone is more intense here com compared to um, the Tundra Rose. I had trouble creating a dark mask tone with the Tundra Rose. So my guess is that it's a bit less opaque. Yeah, see? how it the color separated we can see a lot of blues here and some like coppers right there it's so pretty Ooh. now we are going to try the tundra blue when I bought these colors, I made sure to choose the ones that had the most 
interesting effects like the most color separation. I did a lot of research. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I watched a lot of artists watching their colors. And that's how I made my choice. At first I thought I would buy a set because these can also come in sets. So you have the Tundra set, which I have three colors of. I couldn't have bought this set, but it comes with five colors. And I remember that the other two colors I wasn't so interested in. So I decided to buy my favorite colors from all the sets. And um, yeah, so I did a lot of research. I watched a lot of videos to come up with my choice. And without really noticing, I ended up choosing three colors from the Tundra set. And I chose colors that are either purple, blues, or greens, because this is my color palette that I'm working with for my abstract watercolors. We can see some color separations here. We can see a little bit of green. So it's super interesting. But so far, I think this one is the color that has the least color separation. If I just look at the three that we swatched so far, but we'll see. Now we're gonna swatch Deep Sea Violet. I can see a little bit of color separation already, but I think with these colors, we really have to wait until they're completely dry. Now let's swatch forest blue. No, I only have one color from the forest set. I thought maybe I had more, but I checked and I only have one. It says blue on the name, but it feels like a green to me, but maybe it's just like a difference of like seeing the colors. You know when you ask someone like, oh, which color is this? And they say like, oh, it's gray and you thought it was blue or something. So maybe it's just my eye. Isn't it weird though when it happens? Sometimes I wonder like, <laughs> do people see the same colors that I do? Well, so usually it's like a, a minor difference. So it's nothing very uh, concerning or anything, but it's interesting. Yeah, for me, it's more, it's more like a green than a blue. So here it is. We have one spot left and two Schmincke Hardam colors. So like I said earlier, there was one specific page I intended of swatching these on. But I kind of made a mistake, as I said. So there's one spot left on a previous page. So I'm going to go back to that page and swatch desert green when I'm done with this one. Yeah, <laughs> that happens. But let's swatch Shire Blue, which is a very interesting color. And this one too is, I know the name says blue, but it feels like a green to me. But this one I know has a lot of color separation and it separates into like a lot of blues. So maybe that's why. Yeah, we can already see it. It's so beautiful. I really need to do an abstract painting using this one. It's so nice. Now we only have the interference white swatch here. And then we'll go back to our other page where we had one spot left to swatch the other Schmincke color that we have. Interference white is a color that I really discovered recently. I've used it in my abstract paintings just to add like a touch of shimmer.
And um, of course, it's not gonna work the best on acrylic paints because acrylic is plasticky, it won't absorb too much, but I still put some black acrylic here to see what the color would look like on a darker color. It's not something I'm gonna do in a painting, put acrylics and then another color on top. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna do that. All right, so it's time for our last color. So exciting. It's the Schmicke Hordam Desert Green from the Super Granulation series. And this color is so pretty because it's like a green, but in there, there's also some copper or some like rust color. And you'll see when you add a lot of water, these two colors, they separate and the effect is so interesting. And also it's very granulating as the name says. So we can get quite a dark color. But the magic happens when you add water to it. So let's do that now. I can already start to see some color separation. I see some green, some blue, some red. It's amazing. I hope you can see it well on camera. I think you can see here we have like a band of red. Let's add a bit more. But either way, I'm gonna do some close-ups at the end. So you'll be able to see the effects. It's so good. Now let's do a dispersion test. I really approve this new color that I use for the boxes. I think it's way more subtle. You can really focus on the colors. These boxes, they don't jump at you, which I think they did before when I used the black ink. So I think that now you focus on the color only. I think it's a good idea. And I also like the way I drew them. Previously, I used a, a rectangle that I cut and I traced every size and it's like you had to be really precise but it's way quicker just to trace them by hand it looks a bit more artsy it looks well it's hand drawn so i like the look yeah i approve <laughs> oh and one other thing that i've been doing because i've been putting my colors in this plate i don't want to lose them so i've been painting this painting in my sketchbook to use up all my colors it's based on this picture that i'm trying to recreate so I might work on it a bit more, try to use up all my colors. So no waste. All right, so I wrote down the name for each color and as much properties as I could find. Some of them I haven't found. Like this one, I don't know what is official transparency is. I don't know the series number, but it's okay. And I also did a lift test on each color. So I took a brush, I lifted the color to see how staining they would be. Um, because for the Van Gogh color, it didn't say how staining it was. So I kind of made up a number. One is non-staining and it goes up to four. Four is very staining. So I kind of made up my own numbers according to what I saw when I did the lift test. And for the other brands, there was a number for that. So here it is in somewhat of a color arrangement. First page, second page, and the third page, which <laughs> I did a mistake. I wanted it to be at the end, but it's, it's here. <laughs> so I think that you're ready for some close-ups now, huh?
all right so here it is i have swatched all of my colors i hope that you enjoyed this video that you were able to relax and maybe that you found some colors you might want to get if you have any ideas of which colors i could get if you know of some very granulating interesting colors please let me know and if you have some ideas about interesting mixes i could create let me know as well i will surely do some swatching videos and some color mixing soon because i feel very inspired having swatched all of my colors i have created a kind of a system to write the properties so even if different brands use different signs to let's say talk about light fastness or um yeah some some brands use stars some brands use letters some brands use um numbers so i have created my own system i can show you right here kind of a key like a bullet journal so every brand has its infos and this is what i'm going to translate them to and also i have based my swatching areas on this swatching template that i created in my swatch book and now i have all of my watercolors in here so i think it's gonna be super useful having said that i will let you go i hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did please leave a like a comment and subscribe if you're not already take care i'll see you soon